Hello, good afternoon everyone. Uh, welcome again to uh, Game VCN uh, monthly events. Uh, we would love to uh, bring uh, great people uh, together to talk to you and share knowledge and experience with you guys so, so you can learn more about video game development. Uh, we are super proud to announce that um, Photon has joined uh, Game VCN family this year. Um, so they will be giving support to uh, our teams, uh, implementing uh, multiplayer in case they, they, uh, they want to do it in their games. And uh, today we have a team from Photon with us who is going to share some tips uh, about uh, diving into a multiplayer. So um, team, um, please introduce yourself and, and yeah, and let's start the conversation. Um, just uh, one, uh, one thing, if you have any question for team, you can leave that in the chat, uh, in the YouTube chat. And the, uh, the talk is uh, divided in two blocks, right team? So uh, we can do a stop yeah. in the middle of the talk and see if there is any question to uh, so, so team can answer it. And if not, we will do that at the end of, uh, of the talk. So um, welcome, Tim, and thank you for uh, giving support to uh, GameBCN. Well, thank you for having me, Oscar. It's been a pleasure. And I'm definitely looking forward to sharing some of the, the fundamentals required to be aware of before going into game development to, well, your community, as well as the studios already part of the programs, whether they are alumni and have graduated or considering joining next year. So, well, in this case, if we're all set, let's get this show on the road. Nope. All right, so diving into multiplayer, the fundamentals. I'm Tim, I'm a producer and software engineer at Photon. And today, I will lead you down the road of the fundamentals that you have to consider when digging into multiplayers. As Oscar has already mentioned before, this talk is split into two parts. The first one is we'll consider what multiplayer means for games and games as a business. And then we will follow that up with how you choose the right priorities as well as the right solutions to solve the problems that you will face in multiplayer. With no further ado, let me quickly also give you an overview of what we do at Photon. And that is, of course, connect players in real time. We have over 550 studios and developers registered with us using our tools to make the best multiplayer experience they can for their, for their players. And of course, this translates into just a bunch of trust that we have. Also, all the players that are currently on our system make about 5% of Steam at peak time. And all these companies and so many more have built countless games using our services that are rock solid and therefore are also battle tested. But so let's wrap this up and actually ask us the question for you as a developer, what are games? Because we are fully aware what games are for the player, their entertainment, their pastime. But for us as developers, and in particular for you as an indie developer, what is it? Is it just an expression of your creativity just to get your point across, to communicate your point of view to the players? Or is it also a business? Because at the end of the day, as creative as we all might be, we still need to pay the bills. That is an unfortunate truth of our lives. And so if you need to pay the bills, how are you going to do that? And more specifically, as game developers, what does that mean for multiplayer games today? If we actually look at the state of the market as of 2021, most games that are racking in the most revenue, but also are the most popular across all platforms, whether we're talking mobile, PC, any of the consoles, include to some extent a multiplayer feature. Now, there's an important distinction that needs to be made here. 
When we say multiplayer, it just means connecting players together to play a game at the same time. However, there are also social aspects to it. And this was particularly shown in games, for instance, like Mirror's Edge, which made a big emphasis that it was not multiplayer, as in real-time multiplayer, but just social play. Some of these games, as you may see here, exist as well among those top tens. Among other things, for instance, Candy Crush and Coin Master. These are games where you might have leaderboards, but you do not have a real-time interaction between the players. Now, you might ask yourself, why do you care? Well, because your players care. The, the latest research out of France shows that over a third of players wants to play online. And the reason is fairly straightforward. We, as human beings, are social animals. And therefore, it is important to any one of us to have human interactions. Now, of course, up until a couple of decades ago, this meant physically meeting up and, well, just hanging out, essentially. However, with the rise of internet and digital media, this has also become intrinsic to the content that we consume digitally. Just because we might not be physically in the same place does not mean we don't want to spend time together. And this has shown time and time again that it is important to your player base whether or not they can enjoy the game that you made, the experience that they are currently enjoying with other people. Which brings us, of course, to the actual question. Why should you even change the model? You might Most of the games are still premium to this day. But especially for small developers, there's one major reason. Cash flow. As a small business in particular, and as game developers, you are always waiting for the release date. That means months, years on end without actual income. And you're just hoping up that it will eventually, well, have a return on investment on release. That means your business is not necessarily a fault. How do you finance your day-to-day -day operation? How do you stack up your old profits against what you might get in future income, but are not 100% sure? This is a huge risk for us. And unfortunately, a big reason why smaller studios end up closing. So what does that mean for development? Well, instead of just building the game as one and then releasing it, which means that you don't have necessarily the luxury of piecemealing the different parts that you need to do for the game, you should look into a more iterative and agile workflow. What does this translate to exactly for your revenue or for your time to market at first? Instead of having to wait two, three years until you might have something coming out, you can get much quicker to an MVP, a product that can be brought to market and also that will for you start generating income. This by no means that by no means means that it is finished or that it's necessarily done, but it means that it is already an enjoyable experience for the players, meaning that this revenue will allow you to finance furthermore the developments that you had planned without having to wait for that one big payday or asking for somebody else to give you that much money upfront and getting indebted. This means in terms of revenue, you have already as soon as the first release happened, as we saw here, you can start earning money while still iterating on your design. This is super important because the biggest issue for smaller teams is marketing. Having a big marketing budget in today's market is really the only way to have a momentary impact to get the attention drawn to you and therefore generate sales. What you need in particular is organic growth. And by having it first released to a smaller audience and then iterating on that, you can actually 
better plan out your different user acquisition strategies to see, okay, is the game that you are making actually talking to the people that you were intended to target? Or is maybe your game much more popular with a totally different audience that you had not meant to actually develop for? And based on that information, you can make decisions on, of course, your marketing strategy, on your designs, and how you continue development. This allows you to stay afloat while still already bringing things to the people that you want to reach. But this means, and I know this question is on your minds, does that mean that multiplayer, service, uh, multiplayer games today are live services? Well, not necessarily. But there is a simple point that, of course, all of you are probably already aware of is that if you have a multiplayer game, you will have some sort of recurring costs, whether it is because you want dedicated servers or whether you need to update your software in order to be meeting the latest requirements on the Google App Store or on Steam or the new security protocols that are currently in place. Therefore, it, a multiplayer game does not have to be a live service, but if you want to keep iterating over a longer period of time, it does stem to reason that it is to some extent. But the actual question that is hidden behind there is single player or multiplayer? Do you have to choose? And if so, which one? Well, the truth is you can do both nowadays. All technologies that support multiplayer today are able to function both online to connect players on the end, but also allow you to actually use the same code base to develop your single player. As you're probably aware, even bigger studios, such as the one developing Call of Duty, oftentimes have one studio developing the single player while another studio develops the whole multiplayer. This has up until now essentially meant that two games were developed simultaneously, which also meant that the technologies were not necessarily the same. We have seen games coming out on Frostbite and then on Unreal for another part of the game. And this means twice the design work, twice the development work. But we have come to the point today that you can create your game mechanics with one technology and just decide, all right, you know what? This game mode doesn't need internet. It's just the one player on their machine. Flip off the switch and you have your code base already working for your single player levels while still being able to play online if they decide to connect to the internet. This allows you to still have, for instance, as we saw in the iterative a diagram before to have the multiplayer part released, iterated on, then not only through the revenue financing your development of the content for the multiplayer, but financing your actual single player as well. However, as with everything, what do you start with? And here is the key part. You have to set your priorities in development. There's only so much time and so many resources that you can invest in before you need new funds. And there is also the iterative approach best practice that allows you to piece by piece build up on the different features that you need. With multiplayer, it's no different. The most important part is and remains as always gameplay. There are obviously other aspects that build on top of that, but you need to get your gameplay down first. That is the most important thing. After that, you can, if you desire to, design you know, your matchmaking around it, how you connect players, or your user acquisition. Look into engagement and player communication and anti-cheat. But the most important part that you need to take away from this is that all of these build on one another. They're not things that have to be built together. 
most of the time you will be able to complete your multiplayer game and have a very simple matchmaking to already test things out before starting to look into more complex system that would allow you to, for instance, do ranked matches or even then later down the road, community events such as tournaments. Speaking of which, we of course have a tournament solution. But more on that later. When you, when you think about multiplayer, up until even 10 or 5 years ago, there was a tremendous amount of stuff that you had to do yourself. Hosting servers, actually writing the, the cross-platform netcode from scratch, the matchmaking, the load balancing to make sure that the different sessions would be running, and so many more things that really made it inaccessible to the mere mortals that we are. However, as technology developed, it became more accessible. We have seen the rise of game engines, as we have seen the rise of networking libraries. In case of Photon, of course, we have State Transfer with Fusion that's coming out now. That is the best of the best regarding this technology, building on everything you came to love from Pawn and Bolt and all the state-of-the-art features that you would want today in turnkey. You have determinism with quantum and, of course, player communication using photon or voice. But enough. We will be diving more into what these technologies are, in, in particular state transfer and input synchronization. But before we go down this road, Oscar, are there any questions in the chat? Um. No, Tim, uh, but I do have one question. <laughs> yes, shoot. Um, so, uh, in my opinion, a multiplayer can lead to a more sales of a game, you know, because uh, there may be more players involved in it. So, But uh, it's also more expensive to develop a multiplayer game because you have to balance uh, so many things. Uh, so it works, uh, you know, well. So, I mean, is there any way to measure, you know, uh, if it's worth or not to go multiplayer or not? Because, I mean, for example, it, now it comes to my mind, uh, uh, Hollow Knight, why there couldn't be two players playing at the same time, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. So is there any way that you can measure that? So this is really, yes, there is a business question in there, but... At the end of the day, it is an experience question as well. If you as a developer or as a designer believe your game will be better experienced in a shared environment, then you have your answer already. But to answer more specifically about the cost issue that you just mentioned, it is one that has to some extent a certain fallacy, especially if we take into consideration that as I mentioned before, both is possible with the same code base because that means in practice, if you decide, okay, I might want to have multiplayer down the road, you can already develop your game, your code base using a network um, technology stack such as, well, Fusion for instance. That means you have already your whole game following the best practices for multiplayer games. And if you decide that, OK, we actually do want the online part as well, they can just flip the switch. They don't actually have to have it allowed or integrated when they build their game. Because the, the thing here that is often misunderstood is that multiplayer is not something that you add to your game. Multiplayer games, especially because of the limitations of the internet, have uh, technological requirements and, and code architecture requirements in particular that are much more stringent than single player games. So something that you write with multiplayer in mind, even if you don't go multiplayer from the get go, will still work online and offline. But something that you have written for single player and then later you say, oh, maybe I want to add multiplayer, that will become a very, very difficult job because you would be essentially porting your game from a single player technology to something that can do single player and multiplayer. 
And this is more expensive also for the simple reason that most uh, networking libraries currently available are free for development, which means you could actually start building your game with both features in mind without actually spending money until you actually release that. Good. Yeah. Um, yeah. We have a comment from Natasha uh, Mangan saying that the first Call of Duty has single player and multiplayer options. Uh, they both work with the same mechanics, but allow a player base to join a level from online or uh, LAN capabilities. Um, and we also have a question from uh, Wahix, who is. Uh, who said that is the the made the photon cloud plugin in the unreal marketplace so uh, um, and he says people who buy my plugin wants to make games like among us and fall guys especially this last one will photon eventually support more than 16 players recommended with real time well so yes however there to actually there's actually a two piece question in that same question um, so, well, actually three. So if we start with the Unreal part, um, <laughs> as of today, yes, you have the Photon real-time SDK working natively with C++ and Unreal. It is true, however, that Fusion and Quantum are not yet compatible with Unreal. It is planned for down the line, but I can't speak to it at this stage. The second part is, can real-time or support games like Among Us? Yes, very clearly. Among Us can be built with pretty much any uh, networking technology that we offer and that's also found elsewhere. Now, the question about the player count is one that is difficult to answer because there are few variables to take into account. We can support much more players than 16 in one room, yes, but there are two questions that follow this. Number one is how well does your game run? If, if the way your game is coded, and we will look into that in just a second, actually that is part of the second part of the presentation, what makes a game run well online or not? And the second part is for these kind of games, the issue is less about what the internet is capable of as much as it is the player's downstream internet connection. Because the internet as we have it today exists basically in commercial, so for businesses, and you have then the, the private usage. The private usage, which is what almost everybody has, is focused on downstream. So I can download a lot of information, but I can't upload much. Whereas commercial connections that host dedicated service, if we take you know all of your um, Apex Legend, etc., they run on business connection, which have a great up and downstream. And that's part of why they're used. More on this in a second. So in summary, Unreal and Photon Real-Time, yes, that exists. Um, the SDK can be downloaded from our websites. Two, can Photon support games like Among Us? Very clear, yes, as well. Which one you want to build? We'll dive into in a second. How many players can your game support? Depends on the technology, but also on how you build and design your game. Thanks, Tim. So, um, so there are no questions, more questions right now. So um, let's continue with the second block of the presentation and we will answer more questions at the end of your talk. Thank you. All right. So. Let's dive into the two main technologies that we that we use in multiplayer games today. State transfer and determinism, or as they're also known, state synchronization and input syn synchronization. We will first start with the state synchronization technology simply because that is the one that is the most commonly used. And then we will move on to input synchronization to see how it differentiates itself and what the use cases are for either. So the tech. I will be using as a, a Fusion as an example since that is our 
implementation of this technology. Of course, you might know Pun and Bolt, more on that in a second, but we will be focusing on the state of the art rather than what has been designed 10 years ago. So state transfer, as I already mentioned, has been around for decades. The first multiplayer games have been using state transfer already. And as games evolved and the internet as well, of course, more requirements in terms of player counts and low latency arise. And therefore, we needed to develop high performance frameworks. Now, state transfer in very simple words is simply having a game state held on the server that is then communicated to each client or player, if you prefer, that is connected to your session. This means multiple things. First of all, that the whole state needs to be sent. If this, the most common technique snapshots are being considered, for instance, you take a momentary snapshot at this specific simulation tick of what your game world looks like. And this is then being sent over to every client and replicated so that they have the same world worldview as the server. Now, of course, as you can imagine, this can mean a lot, a lot, a lot of data, depending on how big your world is. And this is also where you already run into one of the potential limitations with state transfer. To solve the issue of bandwidth and the world size, you have two different techniques. The first one is, of course, compression. And you have so-called delta snapshots, meaning if a specific piece of data did not change between the last time that the state was updated by the server, then it won't be sent to clients. This means you will only have to worry about what has changed since the, since the last time you received an update from the server. Another thing is compressing the state, well, not compressing it actually, but only sending certain parts of the world over to the clients. Because if you take a game like PUBG, for instance, or Minecraft, the world that you see as a player surrounding yourself is what you care about. It's what interests you. Anything else in the world, whether it happens or doesn't happen, doesn't matter. It's a little bit like the saying, if a tree falls in the forest, does it still make noise if nobody is around to hear it? As far as multiplayer is connect concerned, the answer is very clearly, no, it doesn't make any sound. What does that mean now actually for the state that's being transferred? Well, if the server is aware of where each player is in the world, it can selectively decide, ah, I'm going to update this player, but they only care about these three objects in the top left. That's what I'm going to put in the package that I'm going to send them. And everything else is ignored as far as the client is concerned. This is also used and referred to as eventual consistency because eventually you will be aware of what happens around you. But you are at this very moment not necessarily aware of the whole game world because simply said, you as a player don't care. The real issue as we look at it is scaling for the requirements of the internet. If you have a Delta snapshot, then it will still grow because it needs to compress the data of the whole world. Now, this is very useful if you have a game mode with very few players or objects that you need to synchronize. Counter-Strike, for instance, is a perfect example of Delta snapshots because the only thing it cares about are the players in the world. Everything else doesn't is, is static in the world. On the other hand, if you are taking your Minecraft, you would want probably eventual consistency because there are so many objects that are currently moving, so many players that can be there, that it is simply too much data to transmit in one consistent chunk to each player. And this is simply done in order to avoid packet loss so that 
people don't well miss out or have visual glitches as of today as i mentioned before a lot of things have improved and hopefully so networking games have been around for almost three decades and as we see also with the products that we have developed these solutions have simply become better and a lot of the things that you as a developer used to have to worry about such as in particular host migration is taken care of turnkey you don't have to concern yourself with it it simply works also if we simply look at what the performance requirements are this is something that is very important to us we are designing tools for professionals who do require performance not as something that they can unlock but what the product is designed for and so we have made fusion from the ground up to ensure that you have absolutely zero runtime allocation as far as your networking code is is, um, is concerned the bandwidth usage is as low as it possibly can be per different object that is networked in your game. And most importantly, the CPU usage of the server. Why that particular one is important, we will actually dive into in the next slide. Because contrary to popular belief, this is not necessarily only important for a dedicated servers. There are different topologies, as they're called, in networking. You have, in, in this case, topology simply refers to how your game state is being changed and where it is hosted. The most common one that everybody has heard of is the server topology, which specifically is, is often called dedicated server. A dedicated server is simply a server somewhere in the world that runs your game and that then updates each client. And in order to play the game, your player has to connect to that particular server. Now, there are a couple of very important advantages. The, the biggest one is state authority, meaning the only thing in your game that can decide whether something has happened or not is the server. Now, this is very important because you don't want the player to simply say, oh, I have a thousand health or I can jump a hundred miles up. That is not good, well, not only behavior, but also will simply cheat other players. It also simply allows you to more, more quickly give players access to the game. You don't have to worry about somebody dropping a connection and then simply not being able to actually play the game. And that is what you see in most of the game today. It's the stability of most game engines. However, there is a big downside, which Oscar had alluded to earlier, and that is the price. Because you need to actually host a server that will run your simulation. And CPU time on servers is quite pricey. But that is where the more common architecture comes back in and that's what we call the host it is also often referred to as client server and simply means that in addition to hosting a player this client also hosts a server simulation now this keeps your cost down because your players are also hosting the game and this is particularly important for us when you consider the CPU usage, especially when you make mobile games. You only have so much CPU to actually run the game and then also the server, and therefore you need to keep it as small as possible. It also still allows you to have the complete game state and therefore quickly change hosts if somebody loses their connection. The downside is obviously that the players are hosts. Therefore, they might hi have a slight advantage because they don't have the same latency as other players. Worst case scenario could also be that they simply hack away at their local simulation and therefore change the game for everybody, which is often considered cheating. And finally, you have shared mode. 
Shared mode refers to the authority of the game state. And in this case, it is not the server who decides what is being done in the world, but it is actually each individual player. You are trusting the player that they will know what's right and then inform everybody else about what currently happened that they have the authority over. This allows, of course, to, well, first of all, not have um, an actual server running, but it also means that there's less, less bandwidth since everyone is in charge of their own view and therefore is more cost efficient. Of course, you still have the issue of potentially changing the game state. So with that in mind, we have seen that state transfer has some advantages, but also some disadvantages. And in particular, we saw that there was a problem with very big game states where you have hundreds and thousands of units that are not player controlled. And so we thought, okay, what is the alternative? Well, determinism or input synchronization. But first of all, let's clarify, what is determinism? It is actually a word coming from philosophy, it, which says that determinism is a philosophical view that all events that are determined by completely uh, by previous existing causes. In other words, every action has an equal or opposite reaction that you can foresee if you know, know the base condition. Now, this brings a very interesting solution because it allows us to have a simulation which is identical for all the players and the only thing that they need to know is what did any given player input at any given point in time. And this is why it is referred to as input synchronization, because the only information that is exchanged between the players is the input. This is, of course, here in order to make sure that it is correct and synchronized done by a relay server. And there are other advantages. Because the simulation doesn't care about networking, but only about input, it allows you to basically have a technology that is already multiplayer, single player, local, online, whatever you want, simply because only the input needs to be exchanged. Therefore, you can run your AI, you can run your physics, your animation without any delay locally and know that this is the correct state, which makes it for people who have never touched multiplayer actually fairly simple, but it does require a lot more work to get into it because, oh, because it is ECS, something that still some people are not quite comfortable with or have use themselves. It's important in this case here also to notice this is an ECS that we have written from scratch. It's called it's based on ENT ECS or sparse set and is has been in production by multiple studios for a good five years at this point. So this is battle tested, it works. And if we take another look at the actual simulation. In this case, the deterministic engine is actually just that. It is an engine. It is something where you write all of your simulation code, your gameplay, your AI, your physics, and any sort of interaction that affects the game. Then, of course, you have the input, and then you have the view, which in our case, Quantum supports Unity, so you have all of your effects, your level design, your models, your SFX, et cetera, running in Unity. Now, as with any of our technologies, this is, of course, targeted at all platforms. And 
works without any garbage collection because there is no runtime allocation. So for determinism, there is really only one topology to speak of because the only thing that is exchange is inputs. This allows you to say that, OK, well, the simulation is always correct. Because even if you change something for you, yourself in your own game state, it's, it will not affect any of the other players. You will simply desynchronize and see something that is not correct. But everybody else will be able to continue playing without any issue. You also have very high stability because inputs are small. It's cost efficient because you don't have to host a server or to worry about anti-cheat. It does have some advantages. And in comparison to the other solutions, there are pros and cons. And these really depend on what is best for you. Because a question we oftentimes get is, what's the best product? There is no such thing as what the be a best product, a singular best product in any realm is unimaginable. The question, there are really two questions that you have to ask yourselves. Number one is, what is your problem? What is the problem that your gameplay has that needs to be solved? And once you have identified the right problem, you can start searching for a solution and then find the right one for your problem. Because if you don't have a, a technical solution that works with you to, for player experience, it will simply be a waste of time. You can almost do anything with everything, but it will be more or less difficult and you will be fighting the framework more or less to get to the place you want. So when you see these product pages, the Fusion is the benchmark for multiplayer FPS or quantum development, quantum disrupts development. Both are true, but they're true for different things and therefore, the most important part is identifying what is your need. Now, it would be very useful if you could just look at game types and see, oh, that's how it all fits in, which, well, very handily, we have to the best of our ability made a map for you, quite literally. As you see with the different topologies, whether it's a server, a host, shared, or deterministic, we have, with our experience been able to map the game types to what generally speaking is the best solution but here also the operational word is generally speaking because as we already saw your gameplay just because you're in one specific genre doesn't mean that you don't have needs from something else and this is why as you see here on the map there are several types of games that are actually doable with either technology, the, but the key aspect is what is your game more like? So if we take, for instance, a shooter, something like Bullet League, which is 32 players on mobile constantly blasting obje obje projectiles at each other. Well, mobile has a very low bandwidth. They also tend to drop connection every now and again, simply because of 3G and the mobile network being sometimes spotty or them between, being between two towers. Therefore, in those circumstances, determinism is your very clear solution. On the other hand, are you maybe just doing your Counter-Strike or Valorant? In which case, you definitely want a dedicated server because you want to be sure that it is as technically fair as it feels fair for all the players. On the other hand, maybe it's just a casual game. So, you know, you're left for dead. It's cooperative. There's no real competition between the players. So it's a you can have it on client host. It's less crucial that it is, you know, 100% equal everywhere. Or maybe you just do something that is massive, really that unseen size before, in which case you might want to opt for shared. All of them present their own, own challenges. 
And of course, the big question, as previously mentioned, is what is the challenge that you face for your development? So why should you go multiplayer? Well, it does help stabilize your development cycle. It does also help you strengthen your player base and overall allows you to not only make more interesting games, but it also helps you make games with more peace of mind. A couple of suggestions, you know, additional reading if you want to learn more about the ins and outs of multiplayer from a technical perspective. Multiplayer Game Programming is a great book by Joshua Glada and Sanjay Madhav. And then also, well, No Bugs Hair. I'm sorry, this, that's the name the author goes by. I can't give you his real name. Has a series of books that are just fantastic. He also has a bunch of netcode related articles on his website. And it's something you probably want to have a look at if you want to gain a deeper understanding of how multiplayer works on a more lower level basis. Something else, if you need more help, there is since more recently the Photon Gaming Circle. This is a membership only community where you have direct access to our engineers as well as at this point over 100 professional studios discussing privately and publicly the best solution that they have found for their game. If you need game templates, support from our engineers about technical issues that you're having with our technology, or just insights, this is probably something you want to look into. With this, thank you very much for your attention. And I'm open for questions if you have any. Thanks. Thanks, Tim, um, for your talk. Um, yeah, you can. Uh, join the circle, Photon Circle, or you can join GameBCN because we also have the support with <laughs> of Photon guys so uh, so they can uh, give you support um, in any in any field. Um, we have, uh, let me check the chat, one question from one MPG saying, how can you make a simple thing like a weapon shot where the projectile uses a Ray trace that needs to be out, like in uh, PUBG, as you as you said. If there is no dedicated to out, then right. So this is again a two-part question. Like first is the authority, and the second one is that one, and that one is less clear. Is okay. The authority based on whom? So. There's always somebody who has authority. So if it is state authority, then you have the choice between having it the, the client or the host or the server. Now, in a dedicated environment, again, the server will simply tell what it is. Host, in a similar fashion, the locally hosted server will have the authority of telling whether a shot has landed or not. If you go into a, a shared environment with client authority, the only way that you can have a validated version is basically programming a client, um, um, a server input plugin on top of the Photon Cloud, which is also possible, um, but then is also more costly. So therefore, the question is really what degree of authority do you need? In terms of determinism, it's the simulation. And since it is identical for everybody, it will be correct. The other question here is, and that one is a bit hidden here, is based on which perspective do you decide on the authority? Because every client, because of the physicality of our internet cables, is actually behind the server, if you will. It doesn't have the latest state, but it sees a, a certain version of the current world. And for this, you use lag compensation, which is well, built into fusion and in quantum again, because it's determinism, you don't really need it. Um, one MPG adds that the host would be uh, preferable. Yes, that is most, well, preferable depending on your context, yes. Good. 
and okay let's wah 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 <laughs> uh, is also making a comment saying what people is usually concerned about is that the player count per room is limited because the message per room is also limited to 500 uh, per second so a sample like fall guys would be perfect yes so actually fall guys is actually better built in determinism to a to a larger extent because their phys the physics that it relies on is perfectly synchronized and therefore you don't have to worry about that limitation then the question about the, the message rate is really, it's a relic of, an, of another time. Because in state transfer, what matters is the changes to your state. These are compressed and sent to the server automatically by fusion in this case. So you don't really have to worry about how many messages yourself you, sh you send. You can, of course, send RPCs, but um those should be far in between like you shouldn't have that many to begin with we have almost no one really that releases a game and that goes oh i, I need to send more messages the situation where that might happen is more commonly in the industry sector for things like virtual conferences for instance but for games that's rarely the case good um do you have um, any other question for Tim? Um, I would love to make you a lot of questions, but I'm not uh, from technical side. I'm more designer, so uh... <laughs> feel free. Uh... <laughs> so, um, well, it doesn't it doesn't look that we have more questions, Tim. So um, it's time to have a call to beer. <laughs> so. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for uh, having you here. And thank you very much for uh, listening to uh, the talk, the audience who's there on the other side of the screen. Um, again, um, can check, you can check again BCN website to see what we do, to see how we can help you guys. Um, again, once again, thank you for, uh, for joining the program, uh, this edition. So. Um, we hope to see you uh, to see you uh, again soon um, with uh, more talks, more interesting things to explain, to share with the developers team. So uh, thank you very much. And hopefully physically soon yes. again as well. <laughs> yes, and and Huaxix, uh, I apologize. I will someday learn your name. <laughs> he says we want more and real samples. <laughs> I will bring that along. Yeah, <laughs> no taken. Okay. So, um, 